Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, August 24th, and here's some of what we're talking about tonight. President Biden makes good on a campaign promise about college debt. We will forgive $10,000 in outstanding federal student loans. We'll explain how this debt forgiveness plan works and share your stories about how much it will or won't help you. Today marks six months since Russia invaded Ukraine. Another attack today killed nearly two dozen people. We'll reflect on the war with the journalist who was there when it began. Also, school started today in Columbus, Ohio, with teachers on strike. Where do negotiations stand to bring them back to work? And what are kids doing in the meantime? Plus, how much is your home worth? Perhaps more if you're white. We'll dig into the case of a black family in Baltimore, and we'll explain how appraising works, or at least how it's supposed to work. Today, President Biden announced his long-awaited plans for student loan debt relief. The new policy would affect nearly 50 million Americans. Here's the deal. <clears throat> the cost of education beyond high school has gone up significantly. The total cost to attend a public four-year university has tripled, nearly tripled in 40 years. An entire generation is now saddled with unsustainable debt in exchange for an attempt, at least, at a college degree. The burden is so heavy that even if you graduate, you may not have access to the middle-class life that the college degree once provided. The plan benefits borrowers who earn up to $125,000 a year. The Department of Education will forgive up to $10,000 of federal loans, or up to $20,000 if a student used a Pell Grant. The plan will also extend a pause on payments until the end of the year. Many of you shared your stories about what difference this might make, if any. Hannah tweeted, My boyfriend and I are trying to buy our first house. Having a little less to pay every month is going to be so meaningful and really help us create a wonderful home. But Aaron tweeted, None. My monthly payments will remain the same starting in January. They will continue to make life difficult and hold me back until I finish my 10 years working in a nonprofit to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. I feel demoralized while I understand some things are better for some people. Hannah, Aaron, we appreciate you both sharing your stories with us. Thank you very much for that. We'll get to more of your stories in just a moment. But joining us now is Jim Tankersley, a White House correspondent for the New York Times. Mr. Tankersley, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. So mixed reactions from some of our viewers, and I think from a lot of people, because I don't know any kind of debt that is as hatefully despised as student loan debt, present company included. Is this the kind of reaction the White House was looking for? There had been a lot of debate as to whether $10,000 was enough. Well, sure. The, the White House knew they were going to get incoming on both sides uh, from this plan. They knew that the conservatives were going to slam it. Republicans called it a giveaway to uh, rich college graduates. Uh, and they knew that, um, you know, a lot of people on the left were going to think it wasn't enough because it's not nearly uh, going as far as, for example, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren had, had pushed uh, or even Chuck Schumer had pushed the president to do. But what they tried to do here, I think, was find a middle ground that the president could really justify. And basically what he's saying is he's giving the relief that he promised in the campaign to a certain group of borrowers, $10,000, if you earn less than $125,000 a year. But he's also giving more to what the White House considers needier borrowers, people who took out Pell Grants, meaning they came from low uh, uh, income families when they were going to college. And so um, the idea is that they might be getting more of a boost here from those groups and from the people who see student loan relief as a justice issue. And I think that's the needle they were trying to thread. Talk about how this would work, this forgiveness, as well as the pause on payments. Is this automatic? Is this something people have to apply for? What do borrowers need to do, if anything? Yeah, it's, it's not automatic. It's, there's going to be a process through the uh, Department of Education. The White House announced today a website that borrowers can go to, input their information, wait for an email from the Education Department to send them what the White House promises will be a simple form to fill out to basically prove that you qualify on income grounds for this repayment. Um, 
the, the, the loan pause will just continue. There's nothing you have to do on that until the end of the year. But after December 31st, it will lift. And uh, for the first time since the, really the pandemic began, um, student borrowers will have to start making payments again in January. Let me get to a few more comments. You mentioned some folks who thought that this was a bad idea. Having any kind of debt forgiveness was a bad idea. Bobby emailed, I went to a state university because it was what my parents could afford. No loans, always had part-time jobs both during the school year and summers. I have always paid my fair share of taxes and frankly, I resent this debt forgiveness. No one forced people to go to schools they couldn't afford. There are options. President Biden was asked about this today. Here's what he said. Mr. President, is this unfair to people who paid their student loans or chose not to take out loans? Is it fair to people who, in fact, uh, do not own multi-billion dollar businesses that she want these guys give them all the tax breaks? Is that fair? What do you think? Jim, talk a little bit more about that, about the fairness argument. I do understand where people are coming from who say, hey, you made your financial bed, you have to lie in it, we each have to take care of our own debts. I also know that if I had not been touched by an angel, blessed enough to get to this level of my career, I never would have paid off my student loans. So I see both sides of it. But talk about how the administration is engaging with that debate. Well, the politics of it are very tricky. I mean, it is certainly a thing where um, it's not the majority of the country that's getting this debt relief. There are lots of people who either didn't go to college or went to college and didn't take out loans or went to college, took out loans and paid them off. So you are not immediately speaking to, you know, the largest possible group of voters who are directly affected by the relief. But what the White House and the president are arguing here is, hey, it's, it's important for the entire economy that we do this. These are vulnerable people. These are people who are being held back from a middle class life. And you know, the president is, 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 if nothing else in his career, been incredibly consistent about constantly framing his policy preferences through what does it do for the middle class. And the argument he is trying to make now is, look, a college graduation, a college degree was supposed to be this ticket to the middle class. We sold people that promise as a country. And, and when they aren't able to cash in on that, because of all of the costs of the debt they've been saddled with, that's us failing them as a country. This is the president's argument. And, and so he is really trying to make the case the middle class will be expanded by the people who are now able to afford buying a home, um, sending their kids to daycare, doing the sorts of things, that the stability that you want to be in the middle class uh, because they've had this debt relief. One last comment from one of our viewers on Twitter. They wrote, it will not hold up to legal review. However, it may hold up some Democrats struggling to win their congressional races. I don't know if there's any legal review. I presume the president can just do this under his executive authority. But with regard to the politics of it, a recent NBC News poll shows that loan forgiveness is popular. 46% of the voters that we spoke to said they're more likely to vote for a candidate who supports some kind of loan forgiveness. 33% said they are less likely. How much of this had to do with just the politics of what Democratic candidates are facing in November? I think there are some politics to this. First off, though, very quickly on, on the legality, I, there will be legal challenges. There is a question of whether the president can do this on his own, uh, using an, a sort of a, a COVID emergency authority, uh, basically, to do this. But on the, on the politics, Democrats are really betting that this will energize a particular group of voters who are crucial to their coalition, which is young voters. They have soured on President Biden. Um, the Democrats have been very worried about them staying at home in the midterms. And they are hoping that in key races, young voters will be motivated now because they feel like President Biden has their back. Whether or not he personally got rid of their actual levels of debt, they're hoping that this is a signal to young voters that he's with them and that they will turn out for Democrats again. Jim Tankersley, White House correspondent for The New York Times. Appreciate you walking us through this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. In Uvalde, Texas, the school board is meeting behind closed doors to consider firing their police chief, Pete Arredondo. He was one of the first officers to arrive at Robb Elementary School. Today marks three months since an armed man killed two teachers and 19 students there. Chief Arredondo was put on unpaid leave, on paid leave, excuse me, on paid leave shortly after the shooting. He resigned from the Uvalde City Council a few weeks later. School's supposed to start in less than two weeks, but many Uvalde parents say they still do not feel safe. 
Here's what one told our colleagues at Telemundo. Los niños están bien asustados. Uh, mi niño y mi, ni mi hija también no quieren ir para la escuela. Dice que uh, si los policías están ahí, como quieran, no van a entrar. Si algo pasa, van a estar... NBC's Priscilla Thompson is outside the school board meeting with more. And Priscilla, let's start with some of what we heard tonight before the board went into closed session during the public uh, open statement period. Here's part of what some folks had to say. Watch. Do not take this into closed session. We deserve to hear. Our babies are dead. Our teachers are dead. Our parents are dead. The least y'all can do is show us the respect to do this in the public. If a law enforcement's job is to protect and serve, why didn't they protect and serve my friends and teachers on May 24th? Yeah. I have messages for P.R. Arnando and all the law enforcement that were there that day. Turn in your badge and step down. You don't deserve to wear one. So Priscilla, there are clearly a lot of very strong emotions in Uvalde still, understandably. Where do the proceedings stand now, and how will all of this work? Yeah, Joshua, there has been a lot of emotion here. They've been in closed session for more than an hour. We're now getting word that they are coming back in, so we could have some sort of uh, decision or at least an update in the next uh, few minutes. But as they were in that closed session, you just heard the tension steadily uh, racking up and driving up in that room with people continuing to get on the mic, just speaking to the others in the room, calling on the board to stop wasting their time to come out and tell them their decision. People here are tired of waiting. It has been three months since this happened, and for the entire three months, families of the victims and people in this community have been calling for this accountability, calling for the chief to be fired, and they believe they may finally get that news today uh, and we may have an update very uh, soon for you here but uh, the reason why this happened behind closed doors is because the board member said that this was a personnel matter that uh, according to the rules needed to happen behind closed doors they also received a statement from Pete Arredondo's attorney late this evening that they said they needed to review with their attorneys uh, before deciding how best to move forward Joshua yeah I want to get to that long statement in just a moment and I, I understand I if you Joshua, have to zip away just Go ahead. I think the folks behind me are coming out, and that's because we're getting word that they did just announce that they are firing uh, Chief Arredondo. So they are going to fire the chief. That's that's. They're just making that decision now. They've out, they're out of the closed session. Yeah. Uh, they are out of the closed session. Uh, I heard cheers erupting as I was speaking, uh, and we are told that, yes, they are going to terminate his contract. Of course, this is something that people were pushing for, and with less than two weeks until the start of school, felt like it needed uh, to happen. All right, Priscilla, listen, I, I, if you have to run, just let us know. If you happen to hear somebody behind you and have to grab them, feel free. We will, we will follow your lead. But for now, you're hearing it from Priscilla Live that the school board in Uvalde, Texas, has decided to fire chief, the police chief, Pete Arredondo, for good cause. They had already suspended him, and the recommendation was to fire him. Uh, he released a very lengthy statement that he wanted read during the meeting. It's unclear whether or not that was indeed read. Here's part of what the statement on the chief's behalf through his counsel read. He, this is in his own defense. It reads in part, quote, Chief Arredondo is a leader and a courageous officer who, with all of the other law enforcement officers who responded to the scene, should be celebrated for the lives saved instead of vilified for those they couldn't reach in time and not for lack of effort. It goes on to read, quote, it was the chief, Pete Arredondo, who warned the district over a year before this event of the vulnerability of the district to such an incident, and he should not be waiting with his head on the chopping block because he feared, because what he feared happened, unquote. That's a statement from the attorneys for Chief Pete Arredondo. Priscilla Thompson is gonna run back inside to keep reporting out the story, but as she just mentioned just moments ago, the school board in Uvalde, Texas has decided to fire the school police chief, 
Pete Arredondo for cause over what happened there three months ago today. Part of the back and forth in the community has been about who to blame for this. All the reports about whether the officers knew to run in and confront the shooter or whether doors were left unlocked or whether the officers had the materials they needed to defend themselves and protect the children. To hear the chief tell it from the lengthy statement he released earlier, he warned the district about this in advance, he claims, a year before and they did not take proper actions. From the perspective of the school board, this is the police chief's responsibility as the law enforcement, head of the law enforcement agency there. Priscilla's gonna go in, get us some more information. Hopefully we'll be able to come back to her, but that's the breaking news out of Uvalde, Texas, that the school board has fired police chief Pete Arredondo for the shooting at Robb Elementary School three months ago today. Continues to be a busy night because we have breaking news out of Syria. Two rocket attacks there today wounded a number of American troops. Early indications are that the injuries are minor, but this attack comes one day after the U.S. launched airstrikes in Syria. Those strikes targeted groups affiliated with Iran. NBC Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby joins us now with more on these strikes. Courtney, tell us more about the service members who were stationed in Syria, what they were doing there and how that factored into these, these attacks. So there's only a few hundred U.S. service members there in Syria. They're really all in the northeastern part of that country, northeast of the Euphrates River. Many of them are special forces, although not all of them. And their main role there is to continue to fight against the ISIS presence there. And they do it primarily at this point by supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Syrian opposition forces that are fighting in that area. So what we know about these attacks is this was not ISIS, and that's why this is so uh, this is so potentially interesting and newsy. What the U.S. is saying is that the strikes today it began with two rocket attacks on two facilities where U.S. troops are housed. One is called Conoco, the other called Green Village. Again, both in northeastern Syria. Rocket attacks on both locations. The U.S. military responded with Apache attack helicopter strikes on at least three vehicles, which were believed to have the people who fired those rockets driving them. The U.S. military saying tonight that they, that they killed several of these potential attackers uh, in those strikes. It, what's also critical is, like the strikes that, that you referenced yesterday that occurred, these are also believed to have been carried out by these Iranian-backed groups. So this is, uh, these, these kinds of attacks on facilities housing U.S. military in Iraq and Syria, but largely in Syria more recently, they have been ongoing for some time. And in fact, they've actually been, they've stepped up in the last couple of months. But this is the first time that the U.S. military has responded in a kinetic way like this. And I asked the, the policy chief at the Pentagon why today, Dr. Colin Collin, he said they were specifically retaliating in the strikes yesterday for attacks on two facilities on August 15th and the concern is they wanted to let Iran know that if they continue to back these groups that are attacking U.S. troops there would be consequences. Thank you Courtney. That's NBC Pentagon Courtney Cuby with the latest on U.S. soldiers stationed in Syria. We're continuing to follow the news out of Uvalde, Texas, the breaking news with the police chief being fired with cause over the shooting at Robb Elementary School. Priscilla Thompson is there. She's reporting that out. If we get more from Priscilla, we'll bring it to you right away. But still to come tonight, the war in Ukraine, six months on. Russian forces kept up their deadly attacks today. We'll have the latest from there, and we'll speak to a journalist who was there when the invasion began. We're glad you're with us on this busy night for Now Tonight from NBC News. There we go. I've just heard uh, the first siren has just gone off. Uh, and I've been told by city officials that that indicates that this is a city under attack. That, again, is the first time we have heard sirens in the Capitol Keep. That was NBC's Aaron McLaughlin six months ago on the day that Russia invaded Ukraine. On February 24th, Russian President Vladimir Putin went on state television and declared war. Today, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said that that moment in his country was, that at that moment, his country was, in his words, reborn. That birth has been a painful one. The war has displaced millions of Ukrainians. Tens of thousands have been killed or wounded. 
and key cities like the southern port of Mariupol are under Russian control. The world has felt this invasion in the form of higher gas prices, global supply chain issues, and food shortages. In response, the Biden administration has pledged more than $13 billion in assistance to Ukraine. Today, the U.S. announced a new aid package worth about $3 billion. As it turns out, this six-month mark is not today's only milestone. It's also Ukraine's Independence Day. It separated from the Soviet Union 31 years ago. Today, Russia interrupted those celebrations with a rocket attack. Local officials say at least 22 people were killed at a train station in central Ukraine. NBC's Josh Letterman has the latest. Hey, Josh. Joshua, for days, President Zelensky has been warning that Russia might use the occasion of Ukraine's Independence Day to launch a particularly vicious strike on Ukraine. Now, Ukrainian officials saying that is exactly what played out with a strike that Ukraine is blaming on Russia that hit a rail station in central Ukraine, killing at least 22 people, including, according to President Zelensky, an 11-year-old child who was buried in the rubble. There were also dozens who were wounded in that attack with the death toll potentially increasing in the coming hours. Uh, and this is what Ukraine was scared about. It has been weeks since we've seen any kind of a strike that killed just as many people uh, as this one did today. Uh, but aside from this strike, we also saw Ukrainians defiant and proud today as they were marking that Independence Day, but also marking the six-month anniversary of the start of this war. In the streets of Kyiv, we saw people out and about uh, taking a look at some of the burnt-out Russian tanks on display, many of them wearing traditional Ukrainian clothing or wrapping themselves in the Ukrainian flag as they tried to send the signal uh, that Ukraine is standing strong uh, despite this ongoing war. And there were also displays of support today from Western nations, making clear that their support, support for Ukraine is not ebbing, even as this war grinds on past the six-month mark. The U.S. announcing $3 billion more in security assistance to Ukraine, bringing the total to well over 13 billion since the start of this war. And British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was also here in the UK announcing more British military support as well. Joshua. Six months ago, we spoke to Terrell Germain Starr from Kyiv. Here's what he told us on the day Russia invaded. The bottom line is that this is a senseless war and Putin has attacked this country for absolutely nothing. My friends are, 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 are signing up to fight and are risking their lives for nothing. That's what people need to know. This war is unwarranted. Terrell Germain Starr is a senior non-resident fellow at the Eurasia Center with the Atlantic Council and host of the podcast Black Diplomats. Welcome back to the program. Good to see you again. Thank you. Happy to be back. Oh. I wonder how you see your comments then now in terms of why this war started, why your friends signed up. How do you reflect on this six months on? Well, uh, thank you for having me on again. And my thoughts have not changed much at all. Uh, I am very fortunate that no, none of my friends uh, in my immediate network um, have been killed during this war, I know a number of people who have gone on to sign with territorial defense units. They are alive. Uh, I have witnessed um, uh, missile strikes. I was near them, uh, was almost caught by them. So I've uh, really felt the impact of this war from a very intimate experience. Right now, what we have is a protracted war where people in the West and the intelligence agencies believe that Ukraine would fall in a matter of days. That did not happen, which reveals how little uh, intelligence communities really knew about this country. And what I hope would happen is that uh, more expertise is gained and acquired to really understand Ukraine as an independent country as opposed to the days of Moscow. And I'll finally close out by saying that you see a lot of resilience here. I've been back for more than a week. I'm in Western Ukraine, where a lot of internally displaced people are. And so while this part of the country may not be getting the missile strikes and your artillery hit like it's taking place in the eastern part of the country. A lot of displaced people are here and they are feeling the impacts of this war because they're um, displaced out of their home. 
Yeah, you're a little bit further away from Chaplin, where this rocket attack happened at the train station. I don't know if you know that area at all or can tell us anything about it, but what have some of the more recent attacks been like in Ukraine? How has that factored into this war and also into how the Ukrainian people are doing? Yeah, so these attacks are pretty normal. I've been to Dnipir Petrovsk, uh, that is, um, you know, in the far east of Ukraine. And so these attacks are uh, are, are similar in, that the, in their brutality and primarily because they're hitting civilian targets. Uh, that train station was definitely not a military target. And so it, it just shows you that the Russian military is indiscriminate in its attacks on Ukrainian soil which is counter to how the Ukrainians have responded in, i.e., Crimea and Crimea Belgorod, for example, where they're hitting only military targets. And so, um, you know, th today, uh, right, th well, this past day, because it's past midnight here, um, it, it was the close, the Wednesday was the close of uh, the, what was Independence Day here. And so the morning woke up with, with folks in Zaporizhia and other parts of the country waking up to uh, air sirens and missile attacks. And so this is just for many people here, uh, a cruel way of celebrating 31 years of independence from the Soviet Union that Putin wants to resume here in his Ruski Mir, which is the Russian world uh, translated into English. How does the rest of the world factor into the future of this war in Ukraine? We've heard President Zelensky calling on the entire world to get more involved in helping the Ukrainian cause. The U.S. just announced another tranche of $3 billion worth of weapons and equipment. You've got Finland and Sweden on their way to joining NATO, which I think is exactly what Vladimir Putin did not want. Where do you see the international aspect of all of this going in terms of the conflict where you are and how that affects the rest of the world? Well, well thank you, Joshua. That's actually an excellent question. And uh, Ukraine's foreign ministry is going to be pushed to the wire in regards to signaling its messaging in regards to why Ukraine uh, should matter to the rest of the world. They have a lot of work to do because, quite frankly, there will be a lot of people, particularly the continent of Africa, many a country on the continent of Africa, who would say, well, you know, we, we, um, we there's this um, charm campaign that uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has gone on on the continent of Africa. And there are a lot of people who criticize, who, who criticize that trip, saying that it was a propaganda stunt. But in reality, uh, Ukraine has a lot to work to do in this diplomacy across the world. And so when you talk about the world, we're pretty much talking about Europe. And so right now you have Finland and you have other countries that were not NATO aligned that are turning to NATO because they see Russia as an aggressive neighbor that has no bounds. And so this chess master, this intelligence strategist that many people thought Putin was, is very clear that he isn't because all the things and manners in which these countries are reacting are the polar opposite of what Putin expected. Finally, I'll close with the United States. Uh, even though a vast majority of Americans do support military aid to Ukraine, I do believe that the Biden administration could do a much better job of articulating to American citizens what does it mean to be aligned with Ukraine? What does it mean for America to send military hardware to Ukraine to protect the West of Europe? Which, by the way, when you think about Poland, Slovakia, Romania, um, Poland, all these countries are NATO nations. And so my message would be simple. We can either send these arms, we can either send this ammunition, or we can send your father, we can send your mother, we can send your sisters, your brothers, your cousins, Pookie and Ray Ray and them, however you want to classify, Jose, whomever, right? You know, we can send all of these people there, or we can send these arms. I think that from a visceral standpoint, the Biden administration can do a lot more better job of articulating just how important it is to send arms there and what it means to be aligned with NATO. And too many people really don't understand what those relationships are because so often they're discussed in these wonky think tank circles. But because it's right. getting closer and closer to home, they can do a better job of really breaking down what this means for all of us, the common people.
Yeah, and if this does become a conflict between Russia, Ukraine, and NATO nations, then there's going to be a whole other level of conversation that has to be had. Terrell Jermaine Starr of the podcast Black Diplomats and the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, always good to see you. Please stay safe, and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including an update on that breaking news out of Uvalde, Texas tonight. The board votes to terminate the school police chief and a teacher's strike in Columbus, Ohio, that's keeping students in class but learning online. Tonight's headlines start with breaking news from Los Angeles over the death of Kobe Bryant. This evening, a jury ordered L.A. County to pay $31 million in damages to his widow, Vanessa Bryant, and her co-plaintiff, Chris Chester. They sued the county after first responders shared gruesome photos of the 2020 helicopter crash that killed Kobe and his daughter, Gianna Bryant. Mr. Chester's wife, Sarah, and daughter, Peyton, were also killed. Mrs. Bryant received $16 million. Mr. Chester gets $15 million. The jury deliberated for roughly four and a half hours. A statement from L.A. County in just a few minutes ago says that it is considering its next steps. In Columbus, Ohio, kids are heading back to classrooms, but their teachers are not. The first day of school there is the third day of a teacher's strike. NBC's Maggie Vespa has more. Lesson plans in Columbus, Ohio are on hold, with teachers holding the line for the third straight day. We are going to stand up for our kids. We'd rather be in the buildings with our students. Some students even standing alongside their teachers. I'm upset that I didn't get to go on my first day. Instead, the school year began remotely for the district's 47,000 students taught by substitute teachers. So hopefully we'll be able to go back to class soon and I don't want to be behind. Among teachers' demands, smaller class sizes and building improvements. Those concerns are currently still being negotiated. What's most important that is that we get our teachers in the classroom. This union representing more than 4,000 Columbus teachers and staff striking for the first time in roughly 50 years. A sign experts say of mounting frustration nationwide. Educators in other cities where tensions remain high are closely monitoring Columbus, several of them even weighing strikes. You are absolutely watching what's happening in Columbus. I am, I am, and I hope educators across the state of North Carolina are as well. And it's not just teachers driving the charge. In Philadelphia public schools, janitors and transportation workers recently voted to strike. In St. Louis, driver shortages left eight schools without bus service for the first couple weeks. Back here in Columbus, negotiations resumed today, and tonight the superintendent tells us nothing has changed. Kids will learn remotely again tomorrow. That was NBC's Maggie Vespa reporting. Let's get back to this week's primaries. In Florida, Charlie Crist defeated Nikki Freed in the Democratic primary for governor. Chris has been governor as a Republican, but he served in Congress as an independent and eventually a Democrat. He will take on incumbent Governor Ron DeSantis. Meanwhile, Central Florida Congresswoman Val Demings won the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate. She will challenge Republican incumbent Marco Rubio. NBC Shaquille Brewster has more from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Hi there. Well, the general election matchups here in this battleground state of Florida are now officially set. Let's start with the governor's race because this is the one that had the much more contentious primary on the Democratic side. There, Congressman Charlie Chris defeated Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed by a comfortable margin last night. He now goes on to face incumbent Governor Ron DeSantis. And I'll tell you already, you have both sides sniping at one another. We're getting a preview of what this general election battle will Will look like. I want you to listen to a little bit of what we heard from both sides, Representative Chris and Governor DeSantis, just within the past 24 hours. We will fight the woke in the businesses. We will fight the woke in government agencies. We will fight the woke in our schools. We will never, ever surrender to the woke agenda. Florida is the state where woke goes to die. He is for the hard right a red meat vote of Republican primary voters in Iowa and New Hampshire. And his blind ambition for the presidency of the United States of America has taken his eye off the ball of this most beautiful state in the country. 
Chris just this morning releasing a new campaign video mirroring that exact message, saying that he plans to go after DeSantis, calling him a divider in the state of Florida. He told us on Morning Joe this morning that he wants to be a campaign of love and have a governing policy that is built around love. But already we're seeing both sides go back and forth. The DeSantis campaign firing out a digital ad at Chris based on some comments that he made this morning suggesting that he wasn't open to people who voted for DeSantis to come on board. We're going to see that fight continue all the way to November. But look, this is Florida, so one fight is not enough. We also know that the Senate battle, the battle for U.S. Senate, has officially been set as well. Last night, Val Demings securing the nomination to take on Senator Marco Rubio. That is another race, Joshua, that we are watching extremely closely. We know that Val Demings has been able to raise significant amounts of money. Polling has showed the race extremely close, at least in this early phase. But Marco Rubio signaling today at multiple campaign stops that he is ready for the fight ahead. Both races here in Florida setting up some pretty marquee matchups that will be watched not just by folks here in Florida, but really folks all across the nation. Back to you. Thank you, Shaq. That's NBC Shaquille Brewster in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. But the big story tonight is the breaking news from Uvalde, Texas, where the school board voted tonight, just a few minutes ago, to terminate police chief Pete Arredondo effective immediately. He's the first law enforcement officer to lose his job over the response to the shooting at Robb Elementary School, where two adults and 19 children were killed. We heard a lot of impassioned and angry pleas to fire the chief all day today. He has maintained that he warned of the problems at Robb Elementary long before the shooting happened. Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez said this in response to the firing. This is just the beginning of accountability. We need to find out how in the world five other law enforcement agencies didn't go in like they were supposed to. Chief Arredondo said in a statement through his attorney that he's being the fall guy here. Do you see it that way? No, um, Pete Arredondo should absolutely, what happened to him today should be happening, but it should happen to a heck of a lot of other people at the top levels of their different law enforcement agencies. That is something that the chief might agree with. He released a very lengthy statement today claiming that he did everything he could the day of the shooting and that there is blame to go around. The statement reads in part, quote, Chief Arredondo is a leader and a courageous officer who, with all of the other law enforcement officers who responded to the scene, should be celebrated for the lives saved instead of vilified for those they couldn't reach in time and not for lack of effort. It goes on to read, quote, it was the chief, Pete Arredondo, who warned the district over a year before this event of the vulnerability of the district to such an incident, and he should not be waiting with his head on the chopping block because what he feared happened, unquote. That is a statement from attorneys for Chief Arredondo, and indeed the blade fell on the chopping block tonight, just minutes ago, the Uvalde School District voting to fire its school police chief, Pete Arredondo. Priscilla Thompson is still there outside the meeting talking to more residents and officials. If we get more from Uvalde, we'll bring it to you right away. Up next, an experimental new way to prevent binge drinking, magic mushrooms. A breakthrough study could change how we deal with addictions. That's just ahead. Stay close. A new round of COVID boosters should be on the way soon. Sources tell us the FDA will authorize updated Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. They'll target the BA4 and BA5 Omicron subvariants. The CDC says BA5 makes up about 90% of new cases in the U.S. The FDA is expected to sign off on the vaccines around Labor Day. In other medical news, a new study found that the active chemical in magic mushrooms could help fight alcohol abuse. Researchers led an eight-month trial with nearly 100 people. Participants reduced their heavy drinking with talk therapy and pills containing that chemical, psilocybin. So why did this work? And what could this mean for the future of substance abuse treatment? Let's get into that now with NBC News medical fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal, who joins us here at the table. Dr. Sayal, tell us more about this study and about psilocybin. So, yeah, Joshua, this was a study from NYU. It was a randomized control trial, the first ever, actually, on, on psilocybin and alcohol use disorder. And for your viewers out there, a randomized trial is the gold standard of evidence. It's what we typically look for when evaluating new things. 
And they gave one group psilocybin, which is the compound of magic mushrooms, and they gave the other group diphenhydramine, which is actually just Benadryl. Um, and both groups got the therapy, and what they found was that, you know, the group that took the psilocybin from the magic mushrooms actually had an 83% reduction in heavy drinking, and about half of them were, so were sober seven months after their last dose. Why do they think that that worked? What is it about psilocybin that helped the heavy drinkers drink less? So, so that's what we're trying to find out, and our best guess right now is that psilocybin promotes what's called neuroplasticity. And all that really means is it makes your brain more willing to change. Now, the key here is you have to have that therapy, too, because just because you're willing to change, you want to change for the better, not the worse, and that's where the therapy comes in. I can feel people who have taken magic mushrooms go, oh, yeah, it made my brain more plastic, all right. <laughs> yeah, I went to a lot of very plastic places with my brain and did a lot of new thinking. Is that part of it? I mean, you know, all joking aside, that you kind of open up the mind to be able to change, incorporate new ideas, and then therapy, you know, helps direct that? Exactly. So, you know, if you are somebody who's suffering from alcohol use disorder, the, the, the idea here is not to take a bag of mushrooms and go to a house in Woodstock and have a good time and right. expect to be cured. Uh, the idea here is you really need that therapy to guide you to getting that brain to the right spot. Why psilocybin? Why not LSD or THC, the, the psychoactive chemical in cannabis? Why this in particular? So, so there was a pilot study a few years ago by NYU. Um, it, it was the same researcher, actually. And he found that, you know, the psilocybin did hold some promise, so he actually just stuck with it. He chose this one. Um, but to answer your question, a lot of the other ones are being studied as well for, for alcohol abuse, for opioid use disorder, for smoking cessation. Um, so it's, it's really just the tip of the iceberg here. What was it that happened during these trips that helped the participants reduce their alcohol consumption? Yeah, so two things I want to really point out. You know, the first thing they say is that their, their emotions were amplified. So if you're, you're not just happy, you're ecstatic, and you're not sad, you were just terrified. So that's one thing they felt. Um, the other thing was that, you know, they started to see these visual sort of hallucinations that served as metaphors to some of the characters. And we actually have uh, one here for you I'd like to play. His name is John, and he'd been drinking um, for quite some time, and, and listen to what he had to say. I saw a liquor bottle in the middle of a desert, and just nothing's there, just the liquor bottle in the sand, in the desert, and all of a sudden, it disintegrates into the sand. And I thought that was pretty obvious symbolism for my alcoholism leaving me. That's one of these epiphanies or mystical experiences that have lasting impacts on you. And so it's really these metaphors for, for the stopping the drinking. We're, you know, we're interested to see if everyone else has that experience. This was a trial of about 100 people, so we need to see more data on what exactly is going on. I know some people who view this as a frontier of science that is way overdue, that because of the pharmaceutical industry and, and certain research that's been prevented through cultural stigma, that we're way behind in having this conversation in this country. And then I know other people who say, okay, fine, you're going out of a frying pan into a fire. You're replacing one addiction with another. What do we think is the frontier? Before I got to let you go, the frontier for this kind of research on what all kinds of psychoactive drugs can do in ways that might be more productive. Yeah, so you're right. We really are seeing a cultural shift and more of an acceptance in, in terms of psychedelic research. Uh, the NIH has funded its first trial in 50 years um, to a researcher at Johns Hopkins to look at it for smoking cessation. So yeah, I mean, we, we may be behind, we may not be, but the point is, you know, we're moving forward and people are a lot more open to it now. NBC News Medical Fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal, this is a fascinating study. Thanks for explaining it to us. Thank you. How does race affect the value of your home? A black family is suing over what they claim was a biased appraisal. We'll get into the case and how appraising is supposed to work before we go. Housing discrimination is against the law, but a growing number of black homeowners have recently alleged discrimination in their appraisals. Among them, Dr. Nathan Connolly and his wife, Dr. Shani Mott. According to the New York Times, the couple recently sued over the appraisal of their home in Baltimore. It came in at $472,000. Then they stripped their home of family photos, black art and literature. A white friend posed as the homeowner for the next appraisal. The new value, $750,000. 
The couple sued the Maryland-based appraisal company 2020 Valuations and the mortgage lender Loan Depot. A spokesperson for Loan Depot told ABC News that the company strongly opposes bias in home finance. Its statement reads in part, quote, while appraisals are performed independently by outside expert appraisal firms, all participants in the home finance process must work to find ways to contribute to eradicating bias, unquote. 2020 Valuations has so far declined to comment. As it turns out, Dr. Connolly is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. His area of expertise, racial housing discrimination. Joining us now is Chasten Miles. He's a real estate expert and author of the book, The Real Before the Estate. Mr. Miles, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Let's step back from this case for just a second. How are home appraisals supposed to work? Is there a formula that everybody follows? Are there certain conventions and standards in terms of what to look at and what not to look at? Is there an agency that audits it and sets a professional standard? What is an appraisal supposed to be like? Absolutely. An appraisal is supposed to be a opinion of value that is taken into consideration when approving someone's loan or refinance. Um, you can get appraisals for just about anything, really, but they are supposed to be based on facts. They're not supposed to take anything outside of things such as square footage, updates that you've done to the home, the other homes that have sold in the area around you, simply the facts, no race, no family size, no type of discrimination, and appraisers are licensed professionals. And so it, it really blows my mind every time I hear about one of these cases because it should not be taken into consideration someone's race or family, anything like that when it comes to an appraisal. I wonder how you see these, this phenomenon today compared to, say, redlining in the past, which for those who don't know, the Federal Housing Administration used to have maps drawn of all the major areas around the country. And there were parts of the map that were drawn in green and blue, where there were preferences given to federal loans. Some that were drawn in yellow and some where black and brown people tended to live that were bordered in red, where it was basically impossible to get a federal loan. That was so much more overt. How do you see this more covert alleged practice fitting in to the context of all this? Joshua, I look at this as just another form of discrimination or bias when it comes to the housing market. Yes, you mentioned redlining, but there's no doubt that our country has, has had a huge history of, of discrimination and practices when it comes to people trying to get homes, black and brown people trying to get homes. You know, the experiment that um, the doctors did is something that we refer to as called whitewashing. So it's stripping your home of anything that could show that you are a family of color and replacing that with items that would allude to you being a white family or white individuals living in the home. Redlining, whitewashing, it's, it's, it's another form of discrimination that is happening in housing that unfortunately hasn't been put in the books or on the record yet. And so people are getting away with it. And I'm, I'm so proud of the people coming forward about this and making this known because now it is getting the attention that it has deserved for many years. So we've got this lawsuit. We'll see how these lawsuits play out. And obviously the companies are denying any kind of racial bias in these appraisals. There's also larger federal efforts to try to deal with equity in home appraisals and home valuations. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke about this in March. Here's part of what she said. Listen. For so many people in our country, a home is more than just a roof over your head and a place to live. Those are essential needs. But a home represents, in addition to that, so much that is about financial security, that is about the potential to build intergenerational wealth. I think that piece of it, of what the vice president said is key, is the interracial wealth potential, especially since 
after the Civil War, a lot of the ways that blacks were allowed to accrue wealth was through whatever property they could live on and or farm. So land became an extremely vital form of wealth. We couldn't really just go to Wall Street and put money down on stocks and bonds. How do you see the future of this, of trying to address some of these lingering biases in, in the home ownership system? Great question. I am, I am very much so looking forward to see what comes about the Biden administration's efforts to fix these inequalities. This, this task force was, is, is fully inactive right now to, to really focus on investigating the, the differences in these inequalities in the appraisal industry. It's important for everyone to understand that this appraisal industry is not a very diverse industry as a whole, with 97% of appraisers being white males. And so this, this task force, it's, it's going to focus on five different categories that will fully cover not only the, the, the values, but fully go into investigations, governance of appraisers' actions, diversifying this industry, and making sure that the fair housing laws are, are, are how they should be in 2020 and beyond not what was just written and passed before, but making sure that these fair housing laws are holding up to what they're meant to do. Jason Miles, author of The Real Before the Estate. Appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for making time for us as well. You can send us your thoughts and questions on any of the topics we discussed tonight. We're at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, nowtonight at NBCNews.com. We are still following the Uvalde School Board meeting where the school police chief, Pete Arredondo, was fired. You can keep an eye on that story on the NBC News app or at NBCNews.com. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.